And please go ahead, Sarah. <laughs> so um, this is our, our presentation is one thing leads to another. So we're going to kind of do a little bit of storytelling, um, a story of art, indigeneity, and open pedagogy in K-12 education. So I'm going to, and then here's our introduction. Yes, and um, my name is uh, Dr. Connie Blomgren, and I'm an associate professor at Athabasca University. And uh, Sarah, if you want to introduce yourself. Sure. I'm, um, I live in Denver, Colorado. I'm a teacher librarian by profession, and I'm also a doctoral student at Athabasca University studying OER and open pedagogy. Yes, and uh, Sarah is, uh, full disclosure here, she is my... <laughs> My, she is my grad student, and I'm working her. Uh, we're working with her to help shape a very interesting dissertation around the idea of storytelling and OER and what this means. So, um, because Athabasca University is uh, a national university, and we're distributed, and have always been um, a distance education provider, our land acknowledgement is somewhat different than many other institutions. Um, so don't say that's the first Cree word and I'm not going to move into the others because I haven't spoke, spoken much Cree for a very long time but that is where I first began teaching was in traditional Cree uh, Treaty 8 land. But Athabasca University respectively acknowledges that we are on and work on the traditional lands of the Indigenous peoples of Canada, that is the Inuit, the First Nations and the Métis of Canada. And we honor the ancestry, heritage, and gifts of the Indigenous peoples and, gives, and give thanks to them. And then because I am distributed and this project that Sarah and I are going to be talking about is so tied to the land and the place, um, it seems appropriate to also give a, a Blackfoot uh, Nitsiapi uh, acknowledgement here. So I live and work on the traditional lands of the Nitsiapi people of the Canadian Plains and pay respect to the Blackfoot people past, present and future while recognizing and respecting their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship to the land. This area is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. And the image is of Waterton Lakes National Park, which is an international peace park because it shares the border with the United States and Montana. I can see to um, Montana from the, where I'm sitting right now currently. So um, there's many layers of connectivity in this presentation and in this work. Next slide. And then um, I recognize and respect the Cheyenne and Arapaho cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship to the land who are the original stewards of this land. I also wish to acknowledge all other indigenous tribes and nations who call Colorado home. It is because of their sacrifices and hardships that we are able to be here to learn and share knowledge to advance educational equity. So. And so what's interesting is that, of course, um, Colorado is um, along the Rocky Mountains in the United States, and I'm on the, along the Rocky Mountains in Canada. So in Indigenous uh, understanding of uh, North America, the Rocky Mountains are considered the spine of the world. So our project is really around um, a partnership engagement grant that uh, was begun in 2000 and well, we got our funding in 2019, actually. And um, it was to help support uh, a nonprofit a group, uh, sort of a loose group of people, but primarily spearheaded by a woman named uh, Joyce Sassy, was very interested in advancing the legacy of Anora Brown. And Anora Brown, just as it says here, was an artist and she worked in painting, but also graphic design. She actually um, illustrated many uh, textbooks that were used uh, to help uh, children in the 40s and 50s and into the 60s understand um, Indigenous culture. Um, because she decided, although she took her art education in Toronto and studied with the Group of Seven, a famous group of um, Canadian landscape painters, um, she, for various reasons, um, returned back to Fort McLeod in south southwest Alberta. And she um, painted and lived her full life here in basically 
you know, far away from the happenings of, of Toronto or Montreal and the art scenes there. So she's not well known, but yet her oeuvre is very beautiful. So we'll just take a minute to enjoy some of her paintings. This one is called Prairie, Prairie Chicken Dance. It, this is held by the Glenbow Museum. Oh, that's fine. Next one. This is uh, of Gallardia, or sometimes called Brown-Eyed Susan. And it was interesting because this is a, a painting of, she did about 300 paintings of wildflowers in about three years as a commission with the uh, Glenbow Museum, which is in uh, Calgary. And uh, so some of those wildflowers are now uh, extinct. They're no longer able to be seen. But uh, when I showed this image to uh, Sarah and I said, do you recognize that flower? And she just nodded and said, yes. And that's the nature of um, you know, the land and the flowers and the uh, animals that live uh, along the Rocky Mountains until you get very far south. Uh, a lot of the um, plants and animals are very similar. Next slide then. And then this one here is uh, sort of shows the landscape that would be very familiar for Anora to look out upon and is also familiar for myself. This is what I see. I'm where, we're, I'm where the plains meet uh, or the prairies meet the mountains in the foothills. And uh, that picture is looking south. And again, if you look right sort of at the very center where the mountains are, uh, that is Waterton Lakes National Park. And this is an area that um, Anora spent a lot of time painting and exploring and just enjoying. And as I mentioned, it's uh, International Peace Park um, where there's a shared international boundary and national parks, um, Glacier National Park in the United States. So this extension of friendship. Next slide. Now, in, in addition to being um, a painter, she was also a very interesting woman. And uh, if you can imagine, in the 30s and in the 40s, she collected up all these uh, different stories um, from different sources. So um, from uh, when they had the Palliser expedition, uh, they would, uh, the British brought uh, botanists who would document the land and uh, the plants. And she accessed that material and created what was called Old Man's Garden. And it has been just reissued in this year, 2020. And it's a beautiful collection of quote, gossip, about wildflowers. Next slide. So the project, um, we started in 2019. We had um, a free PD workshop and we started trying to develop awareness of uh, this entire um, collection and the legacy of not just the artwork, but all the uh, graphic illustration that um, Anora did, and then also how she was very much what I would call a strong woman. She never married, and uh, yet she was very much dedicated to her parents. She took care of them. So uh, in that care keep, carekeeping capacity, understood many aspects of family life. And uh, so we had bookmarks and library kits trying to develop some awareness and interest in developing OER and a professional learning network around Anora and her legacy. So of course, this uh, dives into um, OER and OEP, Open Educational Practices. And this is uh, Hegarty's Eight Attributes of Open Pedagogy. I encourage you to take a deeper look into that. It's a great resource. And it helps explain so much of all the moving parts of this project, Sarah. So um, we decided, obviously, oh my gosh, COVID hit everybody sideways. And so uh, some of the work that we had planned to do with the Wildflower Festival in Waterton Lakes National Park, again, around developing awareness and helping teachers uh, be more aware of her legacy had to be postponed potentially. So now we're looking at, looking at some virtual micro-professional learning around OER, uh, OER, Anora Brown, citizen science, and then meeting Canada's truth and reconciliation calls to action. 
So sometimes um, a pause or a delay or an interruption <laughs> can actually be a good thing because when I talk about citizen science, there, there's been a very nice um, app that's been developed by the Native Plant Council of Alberta and the biodiversity, I forget the full um, name. Anyways, it's to help document plants and animal sightings here in Alberta. So a very nice open uh, science, citizen science data um, activity that has just sort of started. So, you know, the timing now sort of fits up with them. So that can be very exciting for us. Uh, next. And um, one thing, just before we jump into Sarah, she's going to, no, it's fine. You can just say, keep it there, Sarah. Uh, I was just going to say during the summer, part of my COVID coping was to um, actually go out and make uh, photographs of the wildflowers that I know that Anora painted. And um, I have put some of those up on the website as openly licensed um, images to facilitate uh, teachers and students wherever who are looking at the Anora Brown website and maybe being able to, like in the middle of January in Canada, of course it's cold, 40 below, you're not going to be finding a beautiful wildflower. And even some, some of the wildflowers only bloom for one day. So uh, like blue-eyed grass, just, you know, you're just lucky to see it because it's just blooming today. It won't be there tomorrow. And it wasn't there yesterday. So some of the wildflowers are so fragile. So that was my way of thinking, what would have Enora done during COVID? And I thought she would have been out there studying the flowers. And that's what I did with my photographs. So uh, Sarah, for you. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about like the teacher perspective on things. Um, I've been a teacher librarian for quite a while. Um, and just looking at some of the numbers, this comes from the Bayview Analytics um, report from 2020 regarding curriculum in K-12 schools. And you can see that there's like a 5% that's OER. Um, you know, the lion's share comes from the three main publishers. And this is, this is um, from the United States. So this, um, this was a survey of over 2,100 educators representing all 50 states um, and over 1,300 school districts. But Connie um, assured me that the, the three big publishers that we have here in the United States are also um, the big publishers in Canada. But I, I, I do like seeing a little bit of green um, on this. And also their reporting indicated kind of awareness of OER. And so you can see here, according to the survey that about 31% of, of K-12 educators, meaning teachers and district administration and also school administration have an awareness, are very aware or are somewhat aware um, of, of OER. But you know, sometimes the, the self-reported the self awareness um, might not ensure that, that educators fully understand the capabilities of OER and, and may not be fully aware of, of the licensing um, as we've heard in some of the other presentations. And, and so thus like OER won't be able to be used to its full extent in reusing and revising, remixing, redistributing and retaining. Um, so, and again, further kind of probing into their, into their information, you can see that the educators do indeed have a, a pretty um, substantial knowledge of copyright and public domain, but those Creative Commons licenses, which are those licenses that allow um, for the full use of, of the OER materials is, is considerably less. So um, the, the, the team then corrected for um, awareness of OER with Creative Commons, and you can see that it moved then from, from the 30% the to, to 31% to 23%. So there's considerably less. So there's lots of, there's lots of room for growth and lots of opportunity. Um, and so kind of, you know, the question that I have in being an educator, a librarian and someone who is super interested in OER um, and, and really interested in open educational practices, um, things that were supported by this Sonora Brown project. Um, it, it, it helps me think that like, probably something that would be super important for this would be professional learning for K-12 educators at all levels, right? So for teachers, for district staff, and for, and for the building administrators, so that knowledge of OER can expand and also kind of like how OER can be used to foster a more open pedagogy um, for all of the students. And so um, it's a lot of research also uh, 
speaks to this. And so this is from uh, Dr. Vladimir Shi, and she did um, a study regarding teacher professional learning in public schools in Brazil and, and found that this was indeed so that there was, if professional development was, was given kind of in a step-by-step hands-on way um, that teachers um, became more engaged with OER and, and grew in confidence and that it was important for, for them to have a supportive um, school environment um, in, in order for the, that to be successful. And then also um, just kind of thinking of important professional development components for K-12 educators. Um, you know, this comes from Human Heiser and Ishmael's uh, report and, and just kind of thinking about like, what are the things that need to happen in order to support K-12 educators to, to grow in their OER skills is, you know, having, having it being something experiential and project and problem-based um, guidance for, for establishing PLNs and, and also especially in digital environments. And then um, thinking about the learning objectives around basics of OER and open licensing and kind of moving from the textbook idea into open pedagogy and, and defining quality. And so these are all kind of themes that like connect then back to the story of, um, of the Enora Brown project. And so I'll turn this over to Connie. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, so yeah, what does effective professional learning look like during COVID-19? I think it has to be free, flexible and it has to be free, guided yet par participatory and supportive PLNs, um, responsive to the emerging needs. So again, some flexibility there, creative and generative topics. So I think this is, you know, we all know that everyone is feeling stressed in so many ways. And this, as I said, you know, when I decided, and I took my daughter, who was, uh, you know, came home from university, kind of feeling quite blue about everything in April. And uh, the two of us, we went out and we made these photographs. And I just said, you know, we've, we've just got to keep moving on. And of course, the flowers are beautiful, they're generative. And most everybody who ever sees uh, the work of Anora Brown, they just go, wow, this is so much. Uh, so online resources for educators CC learning, um, both Sarah and I took the Creative Commons certificate course over the summer as part of the project that's increased our confidence and our knowledge about um, how to um, navigate some of the challenges working with a project like this because these images are actually many, not the images, but the original paintings are either held in private collections or in uh, the Glenbow collection. And it was through the work of Joyce Sassy, the woman who created so much interest in Anora Brown and the website and who has just been this total fangirl. This is what happens when you start in on Anora Brown, you become a fangirl. So <laughs> Sarah's a fangirl now and so am I. And Joyce was probably the head fangirl. But, you know, um, Joyce actually um, worked with the Glenbow Museum to digitize the entire Anora Brown collection. And so you can go and purchase a digital file from them. But even in creating this presentation, if you go to the one that we have shared in the Google Docs, uh, it, you will find that there will only be a link to those images, the uh, beautiful paintings that we saw, we can share as an educational aspect, but uh, the permissions are, are not that we can just, you know, allow you to access those, uh, those files that we have permission to use because it's educational. So there's this dancing and dodging, and then of course this idea of non-derivative. Um, so there's lots of, um, as I say, creative problem solving that we've been doing as we go through for many reasons. So um, uh, thank you all. I've uh, enjoyed presenting. Sarah, any closing thoughts? I don't think so, but I mean, just kind of like how our, our title is one thing leads to another in, in discussing this project and in, in creating this presentation and in all of our conversations. Like it, it's amazing how all of the little stories like one one thing does lead to another, which is right. beautiful and organic. Right, and leading, and another comment I wanted to say, one other thread that I'll just mention is that we had um, a Blackfoot elder, Shirley Crowshoe, uh, who um, 
what she was there and provided a uh, opening prayer for our, our original uh, September PD day. And um, she's another fangirl of Honora Brown. And she has also agreed to participate in providing the Indigenous Blackfoot name for the flowers that we're putting up on the Honora Brown website. And if she has additional uh, knowledge that she wants to share, um, she will be providing that as well. So, I mean, there's all these layers and timing. I, it's always fascinating to me how the pieces come together, the timing, and just how, like when I say about the citizen science and the, uh, the app that was developed. And it was exciting to hear this young, you know, 30, 30 year old fellow, I guess, I, I shouldn't really call him young, but whatever, he looked young to me <laughs> on the Zoom call. And anyways, he was just excited about citizen science and excited about the potential of this app to have people tag identification of flowers um, and um, biodiversity of, um, you know, the, the animals in Alberta. And a year ago, that wasn't in play yet. So it's just been recently um, released. And so there's all these, as we say, one thing leads to another, lots of interesting connections. Thank you, thank you, thank you. What a beautiful presentation. Everything that I love bundled in the little package and with an open <laughs> bow, even an open bow on top of it. The paintings were beautiful, uh, the wildflowers, the photos, everything about it, I just love it. Thank you, thank you so much for sharing. And, um, and unfortunately we don't have time for questions, but we do have a space for the communication to continue.